awkward when we never know when we're going to go live. Just like now. Hello. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Keystroke Medium. We are live with Shannon Mayer tonight. It is episode 37, season three. Welcome, everybody. I am Josh Hayes here with Scott Moon. I hope everybody is having a fantastic Monday so far, and hopefully we won't ruin your Monday evening with our fun broadcast. What I hope is nobody's had their computer die on them today. (laughs) <laughs> with the exception of you exception of me because everybody knows i never have a good day on monday no i do actually it's almost always a good day but today was not a good day because i turned on my mac and it didn't turn on yes and i took it to the, mac, to the apple store and they said uh we can't help you we don't do that here you have to mail it in <laughs> that's crazy so uh shannon welcome to the show thanks for uh taking some time out of your evening to come and hang out with us i'm happy to be here it's always fun to do an interview with a couple of other writers and have a kibitz. There you go. Oh yes, we love kibitz. kibitzing. Kibitzing yes. is one of our favorite things. And uh, and Bart of today is talking about my new view. Yes, I have rearranged my office, so it uh, right. it looks a little different. I'm not quite sold on it yet, but the openness does kind of lend itself to a little creativity. So I'm, I, just, I'm still trying to get used to it. That door was like your way out, like a safe zone, but you inform me that that's actually your closet. So. That's actually my portal to Narnia. And so I can, whenever I'm fed up with a manuscript, I can just turn around and go and hang out with uh, yeah, that's a good, Mr. Good Tomness. Right. We got JR, Ken, Lauren, Rick. Uh, All the usuals are in the All show the usual. tonight. And, uh, some, and, some new, and some new names and whatnot in there as well. So I hope everybody enjoys it. Chuck is out sick tonight for everybody that's wondering where uh, Chuck the Man Chuck is. And, oh, Ralph's probably off saving the world somewhere. So... Right. Uh, we wish the best of them luck, and uh, we'll try to carry on the sword without them. So, uh, Shannon, can you uh, get us started off? Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, um, I live on a farm with my husband and my four-year-old son. Um, my husband is a, what we call a gentleman farmer. He farms beef for fun. It's crazy. But uh, so we have 150 acres and we hang out there a lot. I like being on, on the farm and writing my books and um, just kind of living a quiet life. So that's, that's about, that's about all. It's not very exciting, unfortunately, in terms of outside of my writing world. Um, And I got started writing, well, probably like most writers when I was very young with this idea that I wanted to be a writer. And as years, you know, people would say things like, Oh, that's a really great hobby. You know, it's not something you could ever make money at. Um, And, just said, you know, you need, to do a, you need a real job, right? You need a real job. And so probably wasn't until my mid-20s, um, the encouragement from my uh, husband to, you know, actually as a career um, that I started pursue, to pursue writing as like an actual potential career change. Um, because at the time I was a farrier, which um, in layman's terms is a horseshoer. And so we wanted to be able to start a family. You don't really want to climb underneath a horse when you're nine months pregnant. It doesn't tend to be a good mix. Um, we thought, sit, like nothing, absolutely nothing. The horror right. stories I could tell you when I wasn't pregnant climbing underneath them is quite something. I bet. So, um, uh-uh. yeah. yeah. So, so, so I basically, yeah, that's when I started. I was 25 um, when I started to like actually go after it as a, a viable career and it took me about 10 years before I was able to step away from being a farrier um, and and be a writer full-time so it was not overnight it was not overnight at all it was 10 years of work and studying and um, understanding the industry and and working on my craft and all those fun things before I finally kind of broke free yeah so you started well before the uh, kind of the 2011 publishing revolution, as it were, and probably tried some of the traditional stuff and all the things, I imagine. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I did the, all the um, the querying of the agents and learning how to write my query letters and attending conferences where I met agents and met editors. And I mean, I think it actually helped me a lot when the indie boom came around and I took a step in that direction because I already kind of understood what was what they were looking for, even if it wasn't the traditional route, right? Um, because the industry is so much more than just writing a book. There's so much business involved with being an indie author. And, and you know, the agents and the editors and the publishing houses, they're all about the business. Like, 
the books are the product, but they're all about the business. So if you start right. working with them and understanding them a little, I think you have a bit of an insight into what you might need to do. Yeah. Well, uh, I can say that you've all obviously found a, a good way to do it because right now on Amazon, you're number six in uh, most popular fantasy authors, right behind J.R.R. Tolkien. So it's not a small feat for anybody to okay. accomplish. And I was scrolling through your Amazon list, and I, I mean, there's so many books, and um, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Um, do you want to uh, talk about kind of the first book that? You published that. You said uh, uh, right before we went live. You published first published back in two thousand eleven. Obviously, it's not the first book you wrote. Um, but do you want to talk right. about that a little bit, and then um, we sure. can kind of, yeah, you can peel out from there. Okay. Um, so two thousand eleven, September two thousand eleven, I published a book called. Um, uh, as I as I, as soon as I say that, my mind went blank, sundered. Right. <laughs> That's too funny. That's the first um, time I read yours. So whoops. Um, yeah, that, that one was kind of my, um, my debut and I, I, you know, I released it thinking this is it. I'm going to hit the New York times list. I mean, I had like the most ridiculous, um, aspirations because I didn't know what to expect. Um, but that first month I made, I think I made about a hundred bucks, which meant I got my check, right? My Amazon check, because right. you don't mm -hmm. get that. So you've crossed the hundred dollar threshold. So, um, and it was a novella. It was I, it was a novella. I priced it ninety nine cents, and then the next book was a novella, and I priced it at two ninety nine. And the next book was a no novella, and it was two ninety nine. And so by Christmas, I was making. You know, I made three or four hundred dollars in December. I was excited, right? Oh, yeah. um, and that that trilogy um, taught me a lot. Like I learned a lot about different mechanisms that Amazon was offering and what readers were looking for. And of course, that was kind of the golden age where. You know, 99 cents and free were like, they were huge, they were huge deals. They could launch your career in a matter of days, not weeks, not months, it's not years, days. All of a sudden you're making you know, 10, 10 or 15 or $20,000 in a month on three books. I mean, it, it was just craziness. Yeah. Um, but I was not that person. I, I did not launch like that. Um, mm -hmm. Those first few books, I did well, I think. I think probably that first year, like up to the next September, I was managed to get up to a couple thousand dollars a month. I was pretty excited, and I had eight out when I when I released um, Priceless, which is the first in my Riley Adamson series. Right. And it's so, so funny because I had no expectations for it. I just thought it's another book I'm producing the way my readers want, and uh, I released it in like I want to say like right around uh, Remembrance Day in uh, in November. And I like woke up the next morning to like a thousand messages from my writer friends. They're like, you're in the top 100. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? I, I so remember I had no idea. Like, yeah, I remember, I remember watching it. It was crazy, off. right? Like, yeah. Pretty interesting. It was the most bizarre thing. And so I look back now and it, and it stayed in the top 100 and 99 cents. I mean, it was crazy. And so that December, um, I made like $18,000. It was, it, I, I, I had no idea that was even really possible. Like I kind of hoped, but I had no idea. Right. On a 99 cent book, like this bananas. And so, <laughs> um, the thing with that one was I went back, like I've gone back to it several times. thought, okay, why did that one launch the way it did? And some of it was definitely the timing, right? Like, you know, it was just the timing of it. But some of it too was I got picked up by like Pixel of Ink, which at the, at the time was like one of the big players. It was like the book bug of the day, right? right? They picked it up. I got boosted from that. That's where the initial boost came from. And then because it got the visibility there, other places picked it up. And part of it was, was this crazy tagline I had at the beginning. So um, I was raised very religiously and my mother still attends church regularly and i've talked about this before in other interviews because it's kind of funny so all my other books were pretty clean you know sex was off scene there might have been only like shit that might have been the only yeah. word used um sure riley riley's character was not like that she was an f-bomb girl and <laughs> and there was like some pretty heavy sexy scenes and um just the whole thing. I was nervous. I was nervous for her to read it. So I actually put a disclaimer at the top. I said, if you are my mother, do not read this book. As in moms <laughs> and all this stuff. I had more blurb and as people were reviewing the book. They said, that's why I picked it up. I yeah. picked your book up. I remember I that. I remember that blurb. Yeah. It was funny. And so um, 
so I look back, I think, you know, like sometimes it is, it's, it's things come together. They, you know, they become, you don't want to call it fate or whatever you want to call it, but it wouldn't have happened if I pushing hard for that books out to develop a, a, something of a following, something of a fan base, something of a name. I mean, very, very, very small, of course, but it, you know, just goes to show you, it doesn't have to be your first book or your second book or even your fifth or sixth book before it takes off. You know, I know people that have published 30 books and then book 31, but that's the one that hits. You just, right. you don't know always what that market trend is going to be. Right. Well, and that's, but I think that's more the, the normal, I mean, 15 to 20 books. Um, and then even if it even if you don't have your 30th book hit and become a massive success with that amount of books out you're going to see you know some success and you're going to have some really you know passionate readers and your i mean your audience is obviously going to grow as people read your books but um just to have it just to slam and you're right back in the day when you could run a a free deal and it would stay in the rankings it wouldn't go back to the free rankings it would stay in the paid and right. you could really make a lot of money off of that. And, um, uh, but I mean, obviously you figured out a way to sustain that through, I mean, it's what, uh, seven years later and you're still, you know, pushing out yeah. books. So at it. So <laughs> when, when Riley took off, I mean, was that a genre shift a little bit or did, did you try and, I mean, did you intentionally pick genres or you just write what you wanted to write and then try to find a place to put it? Right. Or well, I was always, time. I was always trying to stay within the scope of, of a urban fantasy of a type. Obviously, uh, Sundered, Nevermore, that Nevermore series was um, was a bit thick, um, and so that one is probably my my real outlier, being my first series. Mm -hmm. But um, even the next series, which was my Celtic Legacy, which is kind of almost more of a YA was magic set in the real world. So I was always leaning towards it. Um, the, the biggest thing I think for me has been to figure out what my brand is and blend that into whatever I'm writing. What, you know, even if it's, you know, my, my um, Nick series, which the first book is Fury of a Phoenix. That one has more of a thriller component. It's, it's, it's harder and darker and grittier than anything else I've written. Um, and more about guns and weaponry versus magic. Um, and then the Desert Curse series is more of an epic fantasy feel, but they all have the same kind of female lead that readers come to me for. They come to me for women who are perceived as or not capable, but truly have this core of steel and can take on the world and still, mm -hmm. and still win. And I th think that that's, uh, I mean, I'm happy to write that. That's uh, kind of a core belief of mine is that it doesn't matter what you look like or what people think of you. You know, you just pull up your panties and get to it. Like, get it done, you know? <laughs> get her done. Deal with it. Deal. Kind of like when your computer breaks and then you have to, like, write on your phone because it's, it's gone and whatnot. <laughs> so you have a very active uh, fan base because I've been over to your Facebook page and I've seen that, that, that they like that. So do they do they help you know what your what your brand is or, is, I mean, is that useful to kind of get some of that interaction? I mean, probably a dumb question because it's kind of obvious, but... But. For sure. No, they, um, you know, the, the thing is, is they're really vocal, which I love. They're really vocal about when they love characters, when they hate them. Um, they're very vocal about um, what they hope to see. And while I don't take all of the suggestions or advice, you know, I do keep in mind, like, you know, part of the reason I wrote um, the one of my newer series uh, is the um, the Questing Witch series. The first one is Aimless Witch. The main character is Pamela, and she was a young witch in the Riley Adamson series. And so a big part of why I wrote this these books is because my readers kept saying, what about Pam? What happened to Pam? You know, we want her story. And um, so I do. I listen to them. Um, you know, if they really want something, I'll write it for them, you know, within, uh, again, within reason and within the scope right. of what I'm capable of and have time for. Um, yeah. and, and I think that that, you know, I... I it's kind of a funny thing to say, but I really respect my readers and their loyalty to me and their interaction with me. You know, it's to me, I don't take it for granted at all because I recognize that um, it's not something that, that every author has. And they're, for the most part, they're a crazy wild bunch, but they're all really good people. Um, and, I, and I'm glad to have that around me, right? Better than the other 
the other options right um, out there you mentioned just a, a couple of minutes ago and i, I wanted to kind of hark, hark back to it before i've lost a too far but you were mentioning female characters and how your readers really enjoy uh your version of female characters and so the question that popped into my head was so george r, r. martin has talked about female characters and people ask him all the time like how do you write these great female characters and he says well, I, I just write female characters that's gee you don't do anything special you just write female characters the way that they would be in real life um but you mentioned in your uh talk you said that you take uh, a woman that, or a character that that may not be anything special and you she does she, she she goes off and she does what she needs to do so how do you approach that like just from a a character creation standpoint when you're talking about this is the character that i want my readers expect how do you keep bringing that back as a fresh and likable and, and new thing that your readers enjoy. Right. Well, I think, I think some of it is, is, is exploring the different, I mean, as a woman and as having a lot of female friends, there's a lot of things that can make us weak or perceived weakness. Um, some of it can be body size. Some of it can be, you know, abilities, um, strength. It mm -hmm. can be um, even intelligence or the, just the fact that you're a woman, right? Uh, there and those are can be perceived as as weaknesses um and so i try to tackle something a little different every time uh so you know with riley and the riley adamson world she didn't have any you know quote unquote magical ability she she, she was like a bloodhound she could find people but she didn't have magical spells backing her up so she had her weapons so she learned to fight and she trained herself hard because she knew that she was always going to be the small man in the group, as it were, when it came to fighting. So if you're going to be the small man, you better learn how to fight and fight dirty. Um, and I'll just make a nod out to my mom. My mom always said, she said, don't you ever start a fight, but you better damn well finish them. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. that was my mother's mom. <laughs> That's um, good advice. She's a farm girl. And she yeah. just, and she taught both her girls, all of her girls, that, like, you don't start it. You finish it. And so I kind of take a lot of that sort of stuff and I apply it to my women. Um because the emotional weakness that we all struggle with, you know, like I might seem really strong and confident on the outside, but people don't know what's going, going on inside my head. I could be sure. sweating bullets here having an interview with you. Um, and so that's the fun part about writing these female characters is taking them through an emotional arc that is true to women. Uh, and and I, 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 I can't believe I'm saying this. I haven't read Game of Thrones yet. It's on the list. Um, so I don't know how he writes his female characters, but I, Basically, and everybody women, dies, so, you know. I know, I know. Um, I've heard that much. So um, <laughs> I try to write my women in a way that other other women could um, could truly really connect with those characters and, and either grieve with them or cheer with them and feel like they are, that there's a piece of them in, in those characters because there's a piece of me in those characters. I fully admit to um, writing a little piece of myself into every character because I want that character to raise, but also with me. You know, if I kill off somebody, I'm crying as hard as my characters are. If I have to hurt my characters, I'm not happy about it. Like, cause they're, they're not, I don't want to say they're my babies necessarily because I always think, you know, they're still a product to me. They're still part of my business, but they are pieces of my heart. They're pieces of my, my mind. And so it's, um, it's it resonates. Um, so I always just try to do the best I can in terms of like I say, make care to real women because that's why they're reading it. They're reading to escape, right? Right, right. right. So, so on the flip side of that, and I, and I don't know that uh, you're, you're echoing. Yeah, I know, it's all right. Um, it happens, it'll go away. Uh, I don't know that many authors get asked this question, but and now that we're talking about female characters, what about your male characters? Do you ever get compliments or, or criticisms on writing your male characters? And um, what kind of research and what kind of stuff do you go into writing those? Is it different than your female characters? Or I've I've written a couple of I've written one book solely from a male point of view, and then I actually do what I do split POVs in several of my books. Where like in the Riley Adamson series, you might get every third or fourth chapter from the hero's point of view. Um, I tend to write the male point of views in third person. I find that more comfortable than saying, you know, I, because I'm not a guy. 
and <laughs> I don't entirely know what that's going to be like. Um, not had any, I've not had any, not that I've seen, I shouldn't say I haven't had any, but not that I've seen, I've not seen any reviews saying, oh, you know, you didn't write this male character right. Um, I grew up with boys. I was a bit of a tomboy. I have three brothers and um, obviously I'm married. And, and and I, you know, I've been around enough men that while I would not say I understand them completely because they are strange creatures, um, <laughs> I will say that and smelly. when I get stuck, I, smelly. they're smelly. When I get stuck, I really just kind of go, okay, what would, you know, this brother do? Oh, he'd do that. You know, like I go back to like the roots. I go back to the men that are around me. So the guys in my books quite often reflect my family members when it comes to the guys because, right. I mean, you know, or my friends, right? Um, you know, I have a good friend who's got a really terrible white knight syndrome. I mean, he's an amazing man, um, but he loves to come in and rescue a damsel in distress. And yeah. that's a great character to, to write up and to to play with the, the concept of it. And then I have other men in my life, unfortunately, uh, some of them passed away, thank God, um, that are horrible, <laughs> horrible men, like just horrible. Um, and I write them in and then I kill them off and it's fantastic. Um, you go. But I usually at least have at least have the characters kick them in the balls at least once, right? Because that's oh, just yeah. very therapeutic. Well, ball I kicking think, always uh, makes the story move on. Right, and I'm sure you guys are both just cringing a little. Yeah. I'm sorry about yeah, that. I, I died inside um, a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, um, um, it, it, uh, talking about writing, I think one of the main skills for a writer is to be observant of the world around them. And I think that the, whether you're writing in a, in a male or female character, uh, POV, it shouldn't matter too much. I think that's kind of what George R. R. Martin's talking about is that all the thing, you'd be being, being really attentive to what's around you and, and learning from the world, I think you should be able to write. If you're writing true to that character, that person you're modeling it after, or that situation, um, I think people can tell people want that. Like Stephen King always talks about writing the truth, but he's obviously not talking about the truth, truth, story truth, I guess. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. And I think that you know, getting, you might, yeah, you, you just kind of go back to your roots. Like, don't, you know, I say, write what you know, and you can research the rest. But like, I mean, I try to write characters that, that I love and that I hate because the readers will love and hate them. And, and those two emotions, they will keep your readers coming back, you know? Um, you know, they love to hate my, the guys, the, the, the characters that they hate in my books, man, they, they burning stick and a cross if they could, you know, which is, which is what I want. You know, whether they're male or female characters that they, they dislike. I've got some girls that are also um, on the poop list, so. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, do you have a, a, a number one most hated uh, character of your books that your fans, <laughs> your fans or you will come back and say, oh, why don't you kill off this character? I can't believe they did that again. Right. But there's, um, they're vying for the lead right now. Um, one is probably just a little ahead um, in my Desert Curse series. The main character, um, ex-husband, is a, is a character in the book. His name is Steve. I actually went to my readers and said, I need the name of a right bastard, uh, so please all give me your votes. Boy, that was like one of my favorite posts in, in my whole <laughs> readers group. It, it got probably 400 comments. And the crazy thing was is that Steve, that name came up over and over and over over or variations of it. Um, so wherever you are, stuff. Steve. We're so there you go. You. Where, wherever you are, Steve, they're looking for you. And so Steve is very, very hated. Um, and a That's close so second would be Roger. And Roger, Roger. Roger was in my Venom and Vanilla series, which funny enough was the precursor to the Desert Curse series. So those two series have like the most hated villain, I think, of all, which is, it is this fun. It's fun. I try to actually, I love to make my villains more complex. You know, some of my other ones I've done that um, I really like. I really like Orion from the uh, Riley Adamson series. He was the big, bad, ugly. He's a demon. Um, but at one point, I just gave them this little glimpse behind the mirror. You know, everybody's the hero in their own story. And he says, listen, I'm trying to free my people from from what is basically purgatory. The only way to do that is to bring them to the human side. So in his own head, he's the hero. You know, he's trying to help his people, even if he's a horrible beast and he's going to wipe out the human race to do it. You know, um, 
like us stepping on ants. I don't think anything of it because they're just ants. So, one of your one of your readers, uh, uh, Heather Nelson, uh, says, "I lost uh, you, so you guys." Oh, are, they, are we here now? Okay. 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 There you go. Uh, uh, one of one of your readers, I believe, Heather, Heather Heather Nelson says, "So very true. There are several characters I want her to kill off. Steve and Roger are horrible, but I hate Chris so much too." <laughs> Chris Good is stuff. in the, the Aimless Witch book. Yeah, yeah, that's I, great. I I really believe that stories are made to invoke and deal with emotions and that when, when writers fail, it's usually because they didn't get strong enough emotions out of either the either good or bad or otherwise and stuff like that. Um, so that's all. To that, I think, I think to add to that, Scott, I think some of it is, you know, when as writers, we put a piece of ourselves into our books, but that can be really mm. scary. You know, oh, yeah. because you're going to be judged. And ultimately, you, are, you as a person, whether readers know it or not, they're judging you. Mm -hmm. And so I, what I see happen so often with writers, not just young writers, but all writers, is they start to pull back and they don't put their heart into it. They don't put they don't put their beliefs into it or their and I don't mean by like, you know, spouting off, you know, thou shalt not. I just mean like like my one of my core beliefs is that love is strong enough to conquer just about any. Anything. That's just kind of my one of my mottos, and you see that threaded through most of my books. And um, and so the thing is, is that when writers pull back, when they pull back, it's an okay book. That's what you get when you did. It was an okay book. It wasn't it was okay. a great book. It was just okay. It was mediocre. It's forgettable, right? So if you can pour yourself into it and let your let that vulnerability on your side in. To the story, um, that's I think when the magic happens. You know that. You, that's you when have, you will. Do you have any, on, on, on what you're, on what you're just saying, Shannon? Uh, do you have anything you do when you're dealing with one of those scenes? Because I mean, I've had those two where yet you're like, if people read this, they're going to think I'm this person, and this person is horrible. So I mean, how do you deal with that? Um, you mean from the um, any from any character, any care, even a, even one of my good characters sometimes will do things that aren't great. You know, they'll have a certain attitude or, you know, and um, or they'll say something or do something. And and you worry about that. Are you being judged? Just like you said, it, it, how do you get past that? Have you ever had a time where you're like, like I've had books. I want to I want to unpublish a book because I'm afraid right. people will read that. And then I, I don't. But so how do you deal with that? Um, so that that is something I think that comes along with just uh, it's kind of the repetitive motion of publishing a lot of books. Like, like when I published, I was really afraid of what people would think and say because I grew up in a religious community. Uh, my all my mom's friends knew I was writing, and the first couple books were, you know, quote acceptable. Um, and so I think sometimes you just have to you have to trust your whether you want to call it prompted or guided or chose to write this book, there's a reason for it. And maybe that book, if that makes sense, like sometimes I think most writers, and I'm probably going to get scared for this, but most writers struggle with either anxiety or depression, sort of being really creative. Um, it's the flip side of that coin. And so sometimes when we write a book, it's, it's not really for anybody. I like it, you know, um, and I can say there's a couple books out there, and I won't say which ones, but there's a couple books out there that were that for me. I I need to write them, for, and I'm glad I did it. It was it was scary, but I think you just recognize that your job is you don't know, you don't even know which books um, will touch people. And I, I tell you a really funny story about this to maybe kind of give you some insight to what the way I'm thinking. So I have a pen name. I don't know if you guys are aware of that but I have a pen oh. name and it's and I wrote, I wrote some reverse harem which is a really, it was a really popular genre I wrote it on a dare it a, I wrote it on a, it is a big genre right now actually it's, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> we should talk about that more later anyway but you wrote it on a dare and then what I, happened I wrote it on a dare and um, but it still wrote it with my usual like I wrote the character they were really strong women they were like 40 something women basically taking charge of their sexuality and like 
it was just a round of consent. Like, are you sure, young man, that you'd like to do this with me? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, it was really funny because I got some emails from women who said, that was the most empowering book I've ever read. And you don't understand how much it meant to me to see a woman who was charge of her sexuality, and afraid to ask for what she wants. Like it was wild. Like, and I thought, okay, so even these books that people would consider like throw away people, you don't know who they're going to touch. You know, right. you don't know who they're going to help in that moment. And so I looked at that and went, that was a little eye opening. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I'm writing, as long as I'm following my instincts and, and you know, what my brain is telling me to do and sometimes my heart. And um, and it'll reach people, but it'll reach people. And so, yeah, it was, you know, you just never know. You just never yeah. know. You got to go forward. And that's, that's uh, we have a lot of writers always watch our show. And so hopefully, you know, they it's, it's writing a book is a scary thing. I think people... Um, like where I go to work, a lot of times they, they'll say, oh, you're a writer. I have people that I've worked with for 20, over 20 years, and they're just now figuring out that I'm a writer because I don't make a big deal of it at work and stuff. And they always, yeah. and they have these crazy ideas about what it is to be a writer and what that means. And mm -hmm. I don't know if they realize how hard it is, one, to produce a book because it takes hundreds of hours sometimes. Yeah. And then to put it out there where everybody can just take pot shots at it literally for eternity or however long <laughs> you leave it up there. You know? Right. Hey, it's like well, I've got a great story for a book you should write. Oh, I love that. That's my favorite yeah. thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause, cause yeah. I don't have enough. Well, Thank I mean, you I very much. I didn't have enough. <laughs> didn't have enough ideas. Yeah. Anyway, it's good times. We could go on and on. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say, I once equated um, telling people you're a writer, especially in the beginning. And I do not mean this in a derogatory way at all, but it's like coming out. It's scary. It's scary to tell people that you're a writer because mm -hmm. there's judgment and mm -hmm. there's snickers and there's side eyes and there's oh, oh really so you not you're you know it's it's scary so I was I was the same way I didn't want to tell people even now it's so funny people are like oh what do you do and I say oh my. and they turn to husband and say it's so nice that you can make enough money so your wife can write and I'm just like, <laughs> you're like uh, um, okay I don't even know what it's okay sure you know yeah whatever works yeah yeah it's a you know you you'd almost it's almost like you would get more uh i don't know if respect is the right word but more credence if you just said i shoe horses for a living and people would be like oh yeah that that makes total sense i'm glad you do that or you just say oh i'm a writer i mm. yeah when I when I was still a farrier, we, you know, we'd go out wherever, and they say, "What do you do?" I say, "I'm a farrier." Oh, that, that's so cool! And they want to know all about. It. I became a writer, which I thought was cooler. It apparently is not. It apparently, <laughs> is not. Like, I was like, "What happened here?" Everyone liked me. Stunk like burning horse hoof, but now that I'm a writer and have a respectable job, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. we're gonna, I want to hit the show sponsor here real quick, but before we do that, I want to hit this question from the chat before I lose it. Um, Christy asks, how do you deal with people thinking you're horrible because you write about demons and gods and really dark stuff? You use a pen name and tell no one but strangers and maybe five people actually know, or how do you, I mean, you obviously write under your regular name when you do the, the, the other stuff, but, um, yeah, you get a lot of, uh, do you get a lot of hate or anything like that from the stuff that you write? Um, you know, you do, you do sometimes in reviews, it's usually strangers, you know, um, I've gotten a few, uh, like, like I mentioned, my, my family's fairly religious, like most of my siblings I've written and, and I'm okay with that. Now it hurt a little in the beginning cause I wanted their support and being one of the mm -hmm. younger siblings, I also wanted them to be proud of me. me right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I realized that these people, so it's Christy that asked the question, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes Christy. So, yeah. Christy, the best, the, the best thing I can say to you, the people like that, is to keep writing and make a lot of money, and then they'll go away. They'll go <laughs> away. Because you don't have to deal with them anymore. They're always going to be there. You're always going to have haters. You're always going to have people that call you, you know, devil worshiper or whatever, because you write about whatever you write about. I, I mean, you could write about 
So thrillers and you're horrible because you books. Um, you know, there's a few taboo subjects. So I won't get into too much, but there's a few taboo subjects that yes, I do think sh shouldn't be a variety of reasons. But that's my opinion, and you know, I'm, that's what it is, right? Like, right. I think you're always going to have people. You're always going to have opinions. You, you and you make it work for you and your family, and and then you just go from there. Ignore everybody else. Thanks exactly. with that. That's uh, actionable so advice. So the advice is to be extremely successful and then just do whatever you want. That's that's yes. my basic plan. And, yeah, and even if you're not extremely successful, I think I still think you should do you. It's taken me a long time to get comfortable in my own skin and, and really not give a fuck what anybody else thinks. Um, Indeed. But I think that's the best thing to do is just just you do you. What makes you happy and what makes your brain happy, you know? Um, and then just ignore everybody else. And that's all we can do. That's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Another useful advice. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> that's that's all we really can do. You know, the only thing you can actually control yeah. is your own, own self and your own thoughts and stuff. Um, so we probably need to do our show sponsor, Josh. Yeah. Let's talk about the show sponsor today. It's um, Start Marketing Your Book by Ella Barnard. I've uh, been on her podcast, Author Like a Boss, and so is uh, Scott and Chuck. She's awesome. Uh, she's a great uh, podcaster, and she has written a uh, nonfiction book, kind of collecting what she's learned in that podcast and putting it out in ebook form. It goes on sale tomorrow, but it's pre-sailed right now. I'm going to put the link in the uh, live chat, and it'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, have you always wanted to be a writer? Are you excited about uh, by the possibilities of self-publishing, but nervous about the idea of marketing? This book is designed for writers who are just starting their self-publishing journey. It's also for those who have been focused on putting books out there but not but haven't uh, given much attention to their marketing. In this book, you'll learn fundamental marketing principles that will stand the test of time. These strategies won't become irrelevant or obsolete when algorithms change. Plus, you'll get simple, actionable steps you can take right now. Uh, you'll learn how to market, how to interact with your uh, potential readers, how to identify readers, how to help other authors, how to build uh, your author brand and the number one marketing tool and how to use it effectively, and also what to post on social media, which sometimes I don't even pay attention to. I just post little pictures of cats, just or this is a post. Nick, Nick um, told us to post donut pictures of donuts. If you can't think of pictures of donuts, he said just That's post a picture of donut. Everybody likes donuts. Uh, if you want to know the marketing strategies that successful indie authors use to quit their day jobs and write full time, get this book. Also, fun fact, uh, this is the first book I have ever been quoted in, uh, which is extremely cool. And I felt extremely privileged to be quoted. And just because it's our show and I can do what I want. There you go. Quote, uh, they say writing is a lonely career and it can be, but it doesn't have to be. The bigger your community is and the more you're willing to put yourself out there, the better you're going to be in the long run. And that's by me quoted in the book. You can check it out yourself uh, at the list, the link uh, there in the live chat and also in the show. That's notes. a great quote, Josh. That just made the whole show right there. I, I'm going to just did. turn my mic off and sit back now because I'm done. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say I was... I was also quoted in that book so nice timing on the sponsorship oh, oh good nice. deal. Well, you should dig that quote out read it awesome so awesome. um i, I had a thought to... and it flew out of my head <laughs> um uh <clears throat> so we talk about uh kind of writing characters and what what goes in world them. building uh, yeah i want to kind of get into what goes into your your world building and also your your plots and how you go through actually crafting the book. So um, the, the age old question are a pantser or a plotter. Um, what, how do you sit down at page one and start uh, drafting one of your books? Um, so I used to consider myself a pantser when I first started and I would write timelines um, because <laughs> I didn't think plotting oh, was my cats fighting. Psh, hang on a second. Psh, oh, get out of here. That'd be that most awesome. Yeah, I think this cat fight. That's how first I cat fight we've ever had on KSL. Had had out there. First cat, cat fight. fight. Good deal. Um, <laughs> um, so I now, now what I do when um, I use I mean, I'll scribble down, you know, kind of general plot points that I'm I'm thinking about or scenes I'm thinking about or, or 
or you know, kind of images like that. And then I take it and I type it out into Word. As I type it out, I kind of flesh out those ideas. I'll do is I'll start. Um, just recently, I've started doing this. This is the most detailed plotting I've done to date, where I actually go chapter by chapter. Um, because I was working on so many projects at once that I was finding it difficult to make that leap from project A to project B, project C, project D, whatever I was working on. <laughs> and so this has helped a lot. And I really, I really think that most writers, unless you are, you know, um, I know Jack White, he writes historical and I've been into a couple of his um, classes. He's a pantser. He's a pantser of an epic proportion. That's 30, 40,000 words off into left field and then realize he didn't want to go that direction and then just pull it mm. and write something else and or half a book. And his books are huge. They're, you know, 400,000 words. So we're talking uh -huh. monster tangents. But he only produces a book once every two to three years. Um, nothing wrong with that, especially because in the traditional world, but that doesn't work if you're indie. It doesn't work if you need to produce faster. Sure. So I think that most authors should try and do some sort of plotting, even if it's just a basic, like, here's point A, I need to get to point B roughly so you don't get completely lost. That's been my learning curve. Um, and so that's where I'll start. And then I usually spread out from there and I just start building the characters individually. I try and find names that have some sort of meaning either to the character or to the world that I'm building. Um, in, in the Desert Curse series, I have a, a, re a good reader friend of mine and her husband actually um, um, has studied, I think it's Akkadian, which is a dead language um, from the Middle East. And so they were able to help me um, develop some words and some lingo for that Desert Curse series that, you know, you wouldn't find anywhere else. Um, and and even if only I know the meaning of it, I feel like it gives the world building a little more oomph. Um, sure. And so on from there and dive in. There you go. I you, thought you were going to say her name was Steve. Steve. It was just Steve. <laughs> her husband, his name was Steve, and he helped yeah. me with. No, I'm kidding. So, so go ahead, Josh. I'm do you, sorry. Do you normally start with uh, a just a general idea, or do you start with uh, like a character in mind, and and then? Where does the where does the idea usually germinate from character or plot? Um, I would say probably plot more than anything. I, I definitely have plot driven books. Uh, not to say that I don't try to my best to develop characters well, but I recognize where my strengths are. Um, so, like for instance, in my Fury of a Fiend book, that that idea came from the concept being a mom um, of a little boy. My I, my thought was, you know, what would I do if someone killed my son and my husband and I caught an accident, right? That it was in fact some sort of a hit. So right. it became from this concept of a mother bear kind of going after those who'd done her family very wrong. So that was the, that was the seed, the germination. And then just, we just build it out from there. Um, same, the same idea with venom and vanilla. That was, um, that one was actually probably one of my, deeper series in terms of dealing with concepts and um, um, dealing with like people's choices and character arcs. Uh, and it's funny because that one, because it was that way, is it totally divided my readers like black and white. They either loved it or they hated it. There was just no <laughs> middle ground, which I've never had before. Um, yeah, really, uh, yeah. So, you know, they get used to a certain style from you, right? Um, but yeah, I would say primarily it's probably a single idea. You know, um, Riley Adamson started from when I was, this is crazy, when I was 10, there was a little boy who went missing in my area. It was a news in, in, up in our, our side of the border. And um, he's still missing to this day. And my there was no trace footprint. They didn't find a scrap of hair, like nothing. He just literally disappeared from one second to the next. His mom turned her back or something when he was on the playground. Wow. And, uh, my thought was, what if those kids that go missing without a trace get taken by supernatural creatures because they're special, right? Because they have abilities or powers that they want to develop. And so that's where I was like, okay, if that's the case, then I want to have somebody who can find them, right? Who's special in her ability to find them. And right. so that's, you know, those ideas, those, those, those little moments, you, 
you know, as a writer, I think you really have to pay attention to the world around you. Um, you have to pay attention to what affected you when you were growing up. I mean, I've, I've fully admitted to using, um, you know, scenes and characters and things that I grew up, I'd see something crazy happen and think, boy, that's going in a book somewhere. Like people aren't kidding <laughs> when they talk about that as a writer. Oh, yeah. Like if you're yeah. an asshole, you are probably going to end up in a book and get skewered at some point. Um, <laughs> Or like if you saw a homeless guy carrying a coyote, that would probably have to go. <laughs> yeah, it would. It would yeah. definitely, definitely, right? We, we, I'm feeling like that's an insight, but that's I'm going to be anyway. Yeah, that's an actual. We talked about that on one of our earlier shows because Josh and I ran into this guy and I said, "Was that guy carrying a coyote?" And I really think he was. We haven't 100 percent proved it. 87 percent sure he was. He and, the coyote, coyote and the coyote, and the coyote, and the coyote, and the coyote looked very alarmed. <laughs> like, how did this happen? <laughs> so, anyway, moving right along. So, so go ahead. Uh, I totally lost my train of thought. You guys are cracking me up. So I know. go Coy ahead. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> I do that. So, the coyote threw me. The coyote yeah, throws everyone. Threw us too. Kind of we were like, what is going on here with this coyote right now? Yeah. Kayleen says that needs to go in your next book, by the way, Scott. The coyote. I know. We got to work some sort of coyote reference in there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, I'll, I'll put that in there. So you you went full time, obviously writing now. Um, what does that what does that look like to you as a, as a, a normal day? A, a day in the life. A day in the life. Uh, um, the average I get up uh, about five thirty and go to the gym until I get home. I it's about a half hour, hour drive, so I'm in the gym for like thirty. I work out for an hour. I come home. Get the little guys lunch ready, shower, pack them up, take them to day daycare, and then from about nine o'clock till three, I'm working. I I have a kind of a little rented office not too far from his daycare at the moment because we're building the house, so we're I don't have office space. Um, and I work till three, and then I come home with the little man, prep dinner or take care of the horse or you know kind of farm chores stuff. And then um, once he's, we've had dinner and he's in bed, I generally work in the evening from probably eight till 10. Um, and then I shower and go to bed. Like that's, that's it. Like it's, it's pretty, and that's pretty much, that's pretty steady. Like six days a week, I take one day off. I usually try to take Sundays off during the day and me and the little guy go and do, you know, fun. Mummy saying, no, no, I have to send one more email. No, no, I just have, just, just a minute. Let me answer this question, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, he's very patient, um, for a little guy, he's pretty understanding that this is work. And, and so, yeah, we have that one good day a week that just him and I, and then I still will work in the evenings on, on Sundays, you know, just catching up on stuff, just usually emails and whatnot. Do you have uh, word okay. capsules that you try to meet or do you have any type of, uh, uh, mark that you try to hit? Yeah. On the data? Depending on what my deadline is, my word count goal can be anywhere from 3,000 words a day to seven or eight. Um, it just depends on deadlines and how things are going. I mean, if the, the, if the words are flowing well, you know, I'll just, I'll just go as long as the time I have kind of as more than anything, you know, I've only got, like I say, nine to three thirty ish or something like that. Most days, um, so if it's flowing well, I mean, I'm, I'm on a fast day, I can knock out between 2,500 and 3,000 words an hour if it's going well. It doesn't wow. happen always that way, right? <laughs> you know, and so. An, uh, an hour, that's the part that I was like, oh, yeah, 3,000 3, words is good. But when you said an hour, and I was like, ooh, that's that's cooking along. It's it's taken me to really hone that skill. I, I have coined it as N, N as in nincompoop per minute. Um, um, so novel words per minute, because it's not words, it's not, you know, it's not words per minute, just it's, it's being able to translate your novel fast enough for your, your fingers to keep up and, or vice versa. I'm not sure which is faster, but, um, so and always, it's nice when it does. Usually, usually I get three or four days like that where it'll just flow really nice. And then I hit like that, like log jam where I go, hmm. Not today, time to do some marketing or time to answer some emails or God forbid, time to do my taxes, right? Like something yeah. very kind of more menial that is not, not creative um, and then take a break for a day or two and then back to it. So, yep. yeah. Something that's still got to be done. I like the idea of having an office. I know you're doing it 
because you're building your house. But I've, I've oftentimes thought it'd be neat to have like a writer's office. So you mm -hmm. can get up and go to work, write and come home. Um, could, could go horribly wrong, but maybe it would be a good could idea. I don't know. It's um, the place I've got is a co it's a co-working space. So you, other people can rent desks around you. Um, everybody's been pretty nice so far. There's a couple real chatty people, which are great. And I just put on my headphones like you guys are wearing and they all leave me alone. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, it's, it's good because um, my particular desk is in the back room where there's no windows. Cause if I kind of distracted and be like staring out the window to la la land. So I'm basically staring at a blank wall if I'm not working, which is no fun. So right. might as well be working. Um, but it's a good little space. I like it. You know, it's like you say, it's nice to have that and then you'll even go home, even if I work from home too, right? It's, it's somewhere to pretend I'm, I'm like a real grown up. I go out to my office to work. Yeah, I, I'm going to work. I'm clocking in. I clock That's in and right. do the work. You got to put on your tie and your suit and shoes. Right. And otherwise, I just got to <laughs> just make sure I have a pair of shorts on and then we're golden. Right. Right. Or not. Whatever, Josh. Yeah. Don't yeah. Sometimes don't it doesn't happen. I'm not going to lie about that. Yeah. But I don't even know if I'm wearing pants right now. I've got a new shirt. I don't know if I'm wearing pants. I can't guarantee. Um, I, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned we can tell. novel work. We can, we can right? see your legs, Josh. We know you're not yeah. wearing uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, A lot of people talk about the, the uh, getting out of the flow and not editing while they write. And you mentioned novel words per minute. So I was curious if you meant when you write uh, just leaving all the red squiggly lines and all that stuff, and you're just pounding out the, the draft edit later. You just go. You just go like your ass is on fire, and um, the absolute worst thing people do is stop and go back and edit and dick around with their words and go, well, it's not perfect. Well, it's never going to be perfect. I hate to tell you that. I'll be the mm -hmm. asshole to say it. It doesn't matter how many edit passes you do. doesn't matter how many editors you have go over. It will never be. There will always be one typo in there. There's, um, there's a great Amish uh, kind of belief that, you know, when you create something like a quilt or a pie or something like that, you deliberately leave out a stitch in the item because that's life. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure there's much more, a much more religious reason that, but basically, Basically, that's life. Everything has flaws in it. Nothing can be perfect. Even if you think it is, it's not perfect, you know, and that's okay. Basically, it's okay. So run with it. You'll like get better that. every time. You'll you'll hit 99% maybe one day, and then you'll fall back down to 70 or like the rest of us, but yeah. you'll never, you never hit 100%, you know? I like that. I'm going to use that tomorrow. I'm going to I'm gonna let the squiggly lines go. My problem is, is I, if I start to feel like I've lost the thread of the story arc or the I'll go back and read from the begin very beginning of the book, and that can really knock you down because it's neat when you're in the first two chapters, but when you're in chapter 27, that's a big process. You're like, what? The what the hell am I doing? I would say, yeah. I would say that's that's probably the biggest reason that I write as fast as I do, because <laughs> if if I, yeah, because if I, and the same thing, and that's actually how I edit. So my advice to you, if you want advice from me, Scott, I shouldn't well, I give do. it anyways. Um, so however you, however you finish your rough draft, when you go to edit it, do not stop until it's done. So like I do a read through pass that I re like, I mean, I just bury into it. I mean, I know it's harder when, when you have a day job. I, under I do understand that I was, I was there at one point, but basically the, the faster you can do your edit in this, and I don't mean like speed, but like that you can stay in your edit the less you'll lose that thread as you edit. You'll be able to pick up things easier. Because if you edit over a period of a month, you'll do the same thing. You'll be like, what happened in chapter four? Oh, crap. Yeah, what, ha what, happened that, what happened in that chapter I read two weeks ago? Yeah. So, I mean, I've had I've had stories where <laughs> part, I can't believe, I'll admit this, partway through I go, oh, I need to completely change the first half of the book. Okay, I'll do it later. And I'll just from that point on, take it as I see it now and just run with that. And then back to the beginning when I start my edits, then I do the ripple. Um, because it's just, it's so derailing to mm -hmm. stop and go back and edit and stop and go back. It really is two different parts of your brain, I believe, that, that are editor part and then the creative part, you know, that does the actual writing. Um, and they don't always get along. So just, you know, keep those two people separate. 
Good call. I yeah, I have the exact same problem. I, I, if I could stop trying to make it, um, like fixing all the squiggly lines or fixing like just the weird like. Sometimes my my fingers type really fast, and they type the exact wrong word that I was thinking. And I don't know. I, I think that I'm slightly dyslexic, but I'll I'll think in my head he said, and I'll write he went over there. And my fingers have no idea why like they type what they do. And so I'll be like, blah, 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 and I'll go back and I'm like that's not at all what I had in my head to say. Yeah, and then random, I'll go back random, and fix random it. fingers. We call it yeah. random. No, fingers. they do. It's, it's, happened. Happened. it's a real thing. It literally happened to me earlier today. Oh. I. In my head, I was thinking, this is what I'm going to type. And when I typed it and looked up at the, the screen, it's not what I typed at all. But I think, too, that that's one of the things we have to remember is that nobody's seeing this until it's done, done, right? Like, I actually had a, a reader ask me, they said, how did you know to plant all those seeds in the earlier books for what mm -hmm. happened in book three? I said, I did it when I edited the book. No, yeah. I remember might have had an idea but all the red herrings all the little there's a very very few times that i've had my brain be than me doesn't like where i'll have planted something and thought i don't know what this is for but i'm going to trust that i'm going to use it somewhere um the rest of the times is times where you've gone back and you fix it so they only see the finished product you, you know i think sometimes writers we think like oh my god this is terrible but Right? right nobody's seen it but us so right. it's okay to be terrible we're all terrible we're all terrible at that stage it'd be horrifying right. write that down. <laughs> right. everyone is terrible and you all suck so write that down yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can all suck together until we <laughs> don't suck that's right we're all terrible together it's, it's in the editing process that's when we start polishing and making it pretty and taking those words that sound like Yoda wrote it and be like, mm, now Yoda's not in this book, so let's change that around, you know? <laughs> Maybe Yoda can be in another book. Yoda can have his own. Yeah. Uh, well, we That's sci-fi, not urban and, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're completely different things, Scott. Uh, what? Whoops. Shannon, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Uh, really great talking with you. I really had a good time. Thank you so much it's for coming on. It's been really fun. Uh, I enjoyed it. You can find uh, Shannon books on on Amazon and shannonmayer.com, right? Is your website? Yep, yep, shannonmayer.com, and you can find my newsletter there too if you want to sign up. And I am slowly starting to go wide. Don't tell too many people because I'm nervous about it. But yeah, start. It's a secret. Me too. There are a few books on iBooks, Barnes and Noble, Kobo. So if you're there, go have a snoop, see what you find. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Well, everybody in the live chat, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Uh, uh, any new viewers that came, welcome to the rowdy shenanigans that is live chat of KSM on Monday nights. I know, and I lost um, track of that. Christy said to say thank you, Shannon, for your answering her question oh, earlier, and I said I would tell you, and then I forgot. So lots of craziness gosh, there. Sorry, Josh. Scott, stop forgetting everything, Scott. I'm dumb. Let's go. <laughs> Horrible, just like the rest of us. Right. right. I, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm in my. I'm in my sucky phase right now. I'm going to get it right later. There you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. That's right. Well, don't don't watch the show live. We'll edit it later. We will. Uh, next week we have Craig Schaefer coming on the show, and uh, then a couple weeks after that, Peter F. Hamilton will be here. So you don't want to miss that. We've got a, several other guests lined up. It's going to be a good month, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully. Uh, everybody, always uh, welcome to check out our Facebook group, Keystroke Medium. We're the only Keystroke Medium on Facebook, and that group is uh, it's a uh, it's a really good group. If you're a beginning author or you uh, are looking for a tribe, we welcome everyone. And we just like shenanigans. Um, as long as you don't call my Game of Thrones figures dolls, then uh, we'll be friends. So uh, <laughs> it's the other dolls on your bookshelf. Yeah, it's talking. all the other ones. That's right. <laughs> Uh, everybody, uh, thanks again so much for spending your Monday evening with us. And uh, Shannon, again, thank you for spending the hour with us. It's been great. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. All thanks right. Well, everybody, you guys have a great Monday night. Come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing. And, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. See you. <laughs>